Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for those of you who are joining us from all over Asia Pacific today, um, whether it be in your morning, early in India, or later in the afternoon down in Australia. We're very grateful that so many people have decided to take the time uh, to join us today to talk about trust and this new study that it has been conducted by Evelyn, um, looking at the state of trust across Asia Pacific and globally. Um, I'm really excited to be joined today by my colleague, uh, Kirsty Graham, who is the Global President of Practice and Sectors, as well as the Chair of our Health Business across the globe. And we're going to spend about an hour today talking through trust and specifically looking at uh, the role of healthcare organisations um, and their relationship with, uh, with those stakeholders across our organisation. Across our business. So we'll be joined at about half past the hour by a panel of folks within the industry, and we're looking forward to having a discussion. Um, if throughout the day, uh, the session, you'd like to ask questions, you can pop those into the chat. We would love to be able to uh, include those as part of the panel discussion. And so please feel free to use the chat as we uh, talk along, um, and those will be passed through to the speakers as we go. Specifically, if there is a question that you have for one of the panelists, please feel free to pop their name in there as well so that we can direct that accordingly. Um, with no, no further ado, we'll get in and start taking a look at the results of this year's Trust Barometer. So before we get started, why do we talk about trust? Trust is an important component of building brands and thinking long-term. Edelman has been studying trust for almost 25 years now, and we believe that trust is the most important long-term indicator of business success. We know that when companies are trusted, they're four more times considered, they're 14% more purchased, we see customers being far more loyal, both in good times and in bad. You can see that mark there, eight times more resilient during times of crisis. And so for Edelman and for many of the clients and the work that we do, trust building exercises are critical, not just to the, to the communications function, but also to the way that we build business and think about it in the long term. So it's important to reiterate that point around why trust is such an important consideration for us. Before we get into the new study, I just want to make sure that people are aware of the methodology. So we spoke to 13 different countries, nearly 13,000 people and about 1,000 per country. This year's data for Asia Pacific includes only four countries, South Korea, Japan, India and China. But the discussion that we have today will look broadly at some of the work that's been done and the considerations and themes that you may want to think about in your own local market. I'd like to provide us with a short macro perspective before we get stuck in. And this is based on some work that we did in January, looking at the health sector itself. Firstly, recognizing that the health sector is trusted across all regions. So this is again, data from, 2000, uh, from 23 in January, showing that APAC among its peers is still trusted, the sector is still trusted to do what is right and to do the right thing. Similarly, when we break this down across countries, of the 25, 25 of 28 countries that we looked at still see sector doing the right thing, trusted to do the right thing. For me, what's really interesting about this is when we look at the, the left-hand side, we see many countries across Asia, Indonesia, China, Thailand, Singapore, India, these countries who have a high degree of trust in the health sector. And then over on the right-hand side, you can see countries like Japan and South Korea, Colombia, in low levels of trust. One important point to make is that we do ask whether people trust, we don't ask why. That's one of the interesting and exciting discussions that we can have at a later point that we'll do with our panel, but also maybe something that you can think about in your own roles as well. And the last point I wanna make before I move into the new data is that while trust has slightly decreased across all subsectors in APAC, in APAC, sector and the subsectors are all still highly trusted. So hospitals, biotech, health insurance, pharma, consumer health and health technology, all deep in blue trust territory. And this is a great place for us to be. It's certainly not where the sector has always been, but it sets the stage 
for the discussion to come. So today's discussion is around new data that was uh, compiled in March. And there are four major trends that we want you to be thinking about as we go through. The first one is that there are economic fears across regions and globally. So people are concerned about cost, they're concerned about affordability, they want to have access to health, they're concerned about the barriers that cost places upon them. The second is that there, are, there is polarisation within the system. So people are worried about media, they're worried about things being unfair, and they're concerned about some of the societal factors that are uh, causing them to not be able to live the healthy lives that they want to. The third topic for focus is the dispersion of authority. This one is really, really interesting. And so while medical professionals and health industry, or the health, um, health professional industry is still trusted, in fact, family and friends have surged in influence. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that and why that's happening. And then finally, trust and the empowered patient. So people are far more engaged with their health information, with their healthcare professionals, and they want to take action to be able to look after their own health themselves. So we're going to break this down into five themes. The first one being economic fears. So the first piece of data that we want to look at when we ask people to talk to them about their overall health, how would they rank themselves? How would they think about themselves? What we found is that if you are a low income earner, you are far less likely to report good health. Similarly, if you are an older person, age 55 plus, you are also far less likely to report good health. For me, the part that becomes very interesting around this is when we think about both low income and older age, that particular group of people is neither uh, is, is not being able to, to show up appropriately anywhere. And you can see across each of the countries, China, India, Japan, we see some interesting themes coming through that as well. Secondly, when we ask people about a list of socio, uh, societal factors that might be contributing to making them sick, Inflation came out as the number one factor that negatively impacts their net health. Now, it might not come as a surprise for us to hear this. Things are costing more. It takes us a lot longer to get what we need. Pandemic restrictions have also contributed to this. But we now have clear evidence that demonstrates that inflation and the cost of health is one of those major factors, the leading factor that is causing people to feel this way. And we've also asked people whether they feel like it's harder to take care of their health. Here you can see on the left-hand side in March 2022, only 38% of people said that there was a gap between how well they're taking care of their health versus how well they should be. Fast forward to March 2023 and a 14-point increase. So just over half of people saying that there is a moderately to extremely large gap in their ability to look after them for how well they would be. And then we have an additional 30% of people saying that there is a slight gap. So over 80% of people declaring that there is a gap between how well they should as well uh, versus how well they should be looking after themselves and thinking about their health. And this is consistent across countries. This one I really love, the biggest barriers. So I've talked about cost. What we're talking about with regards to cost, cost is healthy options costing too much, People can't afford good health care, can't afford good treatments. So cost is playing a large or a very large role in people not being able to take better care of their health. But at the same time, information is an equal driver. 48% of people saying lack of information, changing health recommendations, contradictory expert advice being a key driver around whether people are actually able to look after themselves. To me, this is really interesting and for many of the people that are on this call today who have either corporate communications, maybe marketing, people in culture roles, we have a responsibility to think about not only the cost, which can sometimes be focused from a commercial lens, but also the communication, the information. And later on, we're going to talk about not just the information, not just what you say, but also how you say it as well and how you show up. When we look across Asia, this uh, trend is still the same, but uh, almost extraordinarily, when we look closely at China and India, we see really quite extreme numbers here. China with plus 10 year on year. So 83% of people saying that cost 
is the plays a large or a very large role. Um, India, same uh, 73. The reason it's not applicable this year is because we didn't measure India last year. This is the first year we have done it, but to C73 as well. And then when you move across to information, 80% of people saying a lack of information, six plus this year, India as well. And then interestingly, uh, in Japan and Korea, we see much lower numbers, particularly around information. So while earlier on, I talked about both South Korea and Japan being markets that don't necessarily trust the sector, they actually do feel like they're getting the right amount of information. So it's something interesting for us to explore. And for those of you who maybe have either responsibilities or are working in either Japan or Korea, something for you to dig into as well. So the second theme that I want to talk about is health now being bigger than healthcare. This one's great. I love this one because what it's showing us, it's confirming what we probably already knew. And that is that when I think about being healthy, we now think about as the number one factor, our mental health. Physical health, social health, and community livability are all major components and dimensions of when we talk about our health. But now, mental health is the number one dimension. So people want to feel happy. They want to know that they can manage the negative emotions above physical health components. All of these are important. However, mental health now is at the top of this list. And we're going to see this theme coming through again and again and again. When we look across Asian markets, we also see mental health. So it's not just um, a single market um, experience, it's happening everywhere. And so we look at, for instance, China, India, Japan, and South Korea. South Korea with a huge number, 94% of people saying that mental health is the key. Not too dissimilar from other markets as well. You'll see these are very, very high numbers outside of APAC as well. What makes this interesting is that there is a story for us to tell. It is not just about Asia. It is a global phenomenon. It is something that we need to take a look at. And as communicators or marketers within, our, um, within Asia Pacific, it's something for us to be working on with our colleagues to think about how we can uh, initiate considerations around mental health as well as some of the products or the uh, medicines that we sell. Interestingly, when we take a step back from that, we also looked at sectors. So businesses across sectors have to play a meaningful role. Of course, we would anticipate that the healthcare sector has a responsibility. But when we ask people what they expect each type of company to play, um, that they expect each uh, type of company to play a meaningful role, what we found is that food and beverage, technology, even retailers still have a very high degree of um, importance when it comes to helping people be as healthy as possible. Even financial services and fashion and apparel. When we talk about that number, 60 plus is really when we talk about trust. This is the expectation. So 83% of people expecting that the healthcare sector plays a meaningful role, but food and beverage technology and these other sectors also playing a meaningful role. Perhaps just as importantly though, when we talk to people about whether those expectations are being met, unfortunately, we're not necessarily seeing them fit that as well. So um, on this one, oh, sorry, we're looking at China first in the market as well. Um, beyond the, beyond the uh, institutions, we're seeing the employer, government, business and media all playing a role, but again, the healthcare system in there as well. And before I talk about the gap that exists, let me just take a moment to talk about the employer. It's becoming increasingly clear to us that the employer has one of, if not the most critical role outside of the healthcare system in helping people be as healthy as possible. And for many of us who are playing roles that work within our executive leadership teams, when we think about the role that we play for people that exist in our organization, the responsibility now for the employer is greater than it has ever been before. And if you take down onto those markets, you can again see China and India with very high, very high expectations. Japan and Korea also in that very high market as well. So going back to the point I was making before, unfortunately, whether people are actually, whether institutions are actually doing or meeting up to those expectations, not quite there. Only the employer is seen by doing well on, on health by half or more. So 55% of people saying, that despite my expectations, which we talked about previously, only 55% of people say they're doing it. But that said, 
the employer is the one that is performing better than anyone else about the healthcare system, about NGOs, interestingly, about business in general, and then government and media. I guess there's a conversation that we might need to have around media as well to recognise the role of media in helping people be as healthy as possible. But it harks back to that question about where people get reputable, reputable information and how they make good decisions. The last slide that I wanted to flag before I move on and hand on to my colleague Kirsty is that within non-health institutions, employers are the only one who are trusted. So when we ask people about the health sector as a whole, 69% of people said, I trust them to do what is right in general, right? And so this is about having ethical practices. It's about employing the right people. It's about making sure that they're operating in good faith. National health authorities a little lower. When we flip over to the other side, I trust the institution to do what's right when it comes to addressing health-related needs. The employer comes out by far on top. Business, NGOs, government and media right down the bottom. But again, very strong call for a role for employers to think about the way they create environments for their people, as well as those folks that are related to them and make sure that we can have meaningful, long-lasting, well lives. So Kirsty, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Will. So in this third theme, um, we're going to look at the rise in peer voices and the fact that we are getting more empowered patients. We wanted to begin on this one by talking about what's happened to trust in the media's healthcare reporting. And it's, it's a little bleak, as you can see by that sea of red. So global numbers have gone down seven points since 2019. So you see a big drop in trust for how people feel about trusting the media to report accurate information. You do see an increase in China and India, but if you move to the right of the charts, you see some pretty significant drops from other markets around the world. You know, Canada down 12, Brazil down 12, Japan down just a little bit, three, but look at the UK, minus 11, France minus 16. So there's volatility and overall, people I have, have lost some degree of trust in the media's healthcare reporting. And as Will alluded to earlier, one of the things that we found really interesting when we saw this data for the first time was this incredible rise in trust in peer voices. So we see it going down in the media, but look at this, it's up 11 points, that box in the, the third box in, 11 points more trust in my friends and family. Uh, it doesn't mean that people are necessarily moving away from experts, but it's certainly putting them on par, on par with pharmacists and very close to scientists. So this incredible rise in people turning to friends and family and trusting the information they're getting there. Not surprisingly, I think, when we look at, we ask people about their behaviours and educating themselves about healthcare issues, and we see big increases in people not just educating themselves, but I think really importantly, making sure they're verifying information that they're seeing that it's true. So big increases in that, in those two domains. This slide, I think, is probably one of the more troubling ones in the whole deck. Uh, if you look at that first bar, for people aged 18 to 34, 44% globally, 44% of those people believe that the average person who has done their own research is just as knowledgeable on most health matters as doctors. That was a staggering finding. Now, if you go to the right-hand side, that drops significantly. It halves to 22% for those over 55. But that number, when we think about the next generation coming through, 44% of people believe in that. We did a little bit of regression analysis to look at whether, uh, for those who did believe they could be as knowledgeable as a doctor, uh, whether they tended to follow the advice of the doctor or friends and family in social media. And what you see here, I think, really underscores why trust is important to health outcomes. If people saw the health system as failing them, they were far more likely to go with the advice from friends and family or social media, if that, uh, even if it contradicted the doctor. 
So the sense of trust being incredibly important as a, as a verifier for people. So if we know that we've got clearly some pretty significant issues in trust in the healthcare system, what do we do to build, to build back from this? We actually looked at people who identified as having made a positive health change. And this included either changes in exercise or in diet. Again, this theme of trust came through as a determinant. For those people ranked having a good relationship with their primary care provider or trust in the health ecosystem really mattered to the positive change. So there's a lesson for us here. If we want to change health outcomes and we want to change people's behavior, trust is unbelievably important. So if we look at trust overall, uh, and trust specifically in healthcare companies, it's remained the same since we took this study last year. 62% of people said in general, they trust healthcare companies to do what is right. I think probably the most interesting data point on this chart, uh, and it speaks to an issue that I think should trouble all of us, especially when Will spoke about the economic issues, is look at the inequality on that bottom box. There's a 12% gap, 12 point gap between high and low income people in how they feel about trust in healthcare. So when we think about how we build back on this trust, here's some very specific messages. For providers, treat me with my whole self in mind. When people were asked what makes them feel well cared for, 79% of people said, treating my medical needs, meaning getting my medication, getting my appointments. However, 76% of people also said, ease my concerns, listen to me, take my concerns seriously, and use terminology that I can understand. And 63% of people said, care about me as an individual. Um, show me, understand the health concerns of people like me, and ask questions about my lifestyle. So this whole self is a very important thing. For health experts, what we heard was, talk to me like I'm your equal partner. If health experts want me to change my behavior, what is it important they do? 60% of people said, include me in the science. Show the recommendation was based on data collected from people like me. A very clear message there uh, for those of you who work on comms and clinical trials. 62% said, show it how it fits into my life. And 67% of people said, give me a voice, allow me to ask questions and allow me to express my concerns. I, th I think this sign is a really interesting one. I think we saw this play out um, in different times during the pandemic. But if we start on the right hand side, for those people who have high trust in the health system, their most trusted source of information is their doctor. Their most believable channel for them is the National Health Authority. And the most convincing uh, uh, tool that they expect is use clear, informal language. However, if you go to the left-hand side, for those who have low trust in the health ecosystem, their most trusted source, not surprisingly, we saw this earlier in the data, are friends and family. The most believable channel for them is my employer. And the most convincing method that a health expert can use is show me your credentials and let me ask questions. So if we move to our last theme now, theme five, we really have come in Edelman to conclude that actually health is everyone's business. This is no longer a conversation uh, just for healthcare companies. I think it strands every business. And as Will showed, there are certainly expectations agnostic of what sector across business. So what do CEOs and employers need to be doing? Investing in our health. And for business, the takeaway was address those broader issues, address the societal factors that are affecting our health. Now that can range from providing trustworthy health information, which we see that people believe employers are doing, but address wider issues like climate, income inequality, showing support for local communities and convening stakeholders to improve healthcare. 
for brands, it's really optimizing for health across your products and operations. When deciding which brands to buy, 64% of people said they consider the impact of the brand, its products, and its business practices, what impact they have on people's health. And I think what's really fascinating is you clearly have a, ver a set of very astute consumers in this part of the world. Look at those numbers for China, for India, for Korea, really high expectations and awareness of how a company is showing up in healthcare. I think this is a very important and powerful slide for CEOs. The message is show me that you value mental health and work-life boundaries. In every presentation we have given on this, this has generated a huge amount of debate. 77% of people say, my CEO must talk about the importance of mental health in the workplace. 78% of people say, my CEO must model healthy behavior themselves, such as respecting the boundaries between work and non-work and actually taking their own PTO. And 83% of people said, my employer must implement policies to prevent burnout. So this is our last slide, and then we really look forward to hearing the panel's take on these issues, but we wanted to conclude with four key takeaways. The first one is address the health inequalities. Lean into what we hear from this. Cost is the number one barrier keeping people from being as healthy as they want to be. It's very important for companies and for all of us to think about what can we do to address those wider societal issues and inequalities that are disproportionately already affecting those that we know are most vulnerable. Secondly, and this comes back to the friends and family theme, we know we need to now leverage this dispersion of authority. People are turning to friends and family for, for health uh, advice. Don't fight this trend rather incorporate it into your approach. It's happening and we need to think about where people are and how we can leverage our comms to make sure we're reaching out to this group because they are influential. Thirdly, invest in employee health. And I think this is a very big takeaway for all companies to say, you know, you run a better business if you invest in your employees' health care. Make this part of your talent strategy and really do it early on in your career. And think about it particularly for those who are on frontline work, particularly think of colleagues who are in the manufacturing uh, sector. Lastly, optimize business around health. We've just said that health is now everyone's business. We know that consumers are taking decisions on companies and where they buy based on how that company performs in terms of its practices. So. Health has a very much bottom line impact on consumer behavior and business needs to incorporate it as a strategic priority, not something that's just done out on the side. Make health central to your products and your business operations. And with that, I'm going to turn to Will to introduce our panel. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, such interesting data for us to get started with. Um, before we dive into the Q&A, let me take a moment to just introduce our panelists. I'm going to start with Ada Wong, who is Asia, Asia Public Affairs Lead for Sanofi. Ada is currently heading Sanofi Public Affairs for Vaccines across Asia and responsible for driving the public affairs strategy, sustainable healthcare financing and pandemic preparedness. Prior to joining Sanofi, Ada was the Head of Public Affairs and Communications with Friesland Campina and was one of, the world's, one of the world's largest dairy companies, where she led the development and implementation of the company's public affairs and communication strategy across the region. Thank you for joining us, Ada. Our second panelist is Aliana Anglin. Aliana is Head of Communications for Greater China and Intercontinental GSK. Aliana is the Head of Comms, and it comprises of nine markets, including China, Japan, Australia, Korea, and Singapore. Tricky group of uh, of markets to work with. She's also Head of Communications and Government Affairs for GSK in Singapore. And in this role, sees, uh, oversees internal and external communications for GSK in Singapore and the greater um, continental uh, region. Our third panelist is Ruth Kuguro, Executive Director of Communications and Engagement 
for Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa at Novartis. Uh, in Ruth's role, Ruth leads her team to foster open, inclusive and strong partnerships with patient communities, media and healthcare leaders in Asia Pacific, Middle East and African countries. She's passionate about the impact strong collaboration can have in accelerating access and developing, and developing innovative solutions for patients. And I, for one, am very interested in Ruth's point of view with regards to this new uh, power balance around information and how we get started. So we're going to spend about the next 28 minutes. I want to be very respectful of people's time with a hard stop. So I'm looking forward to jumping in and I'll put my uh, bios aside and get started. So my first question is for Ruth. So Ruth, um, I'd like to talk with you through the lens of patient advocacy. Um, I wanna make sure that we keep this focus on um, that key area. So Ruth, the data this year has shown that trust in peer voices, when we say peer voices within friends and family, is now on par with medical experts. So given your role as region head of patient engagement and communication, Tell us a little bit about what you see, what you're seeing from the patient advocacy front and what you see as the potential area of either risk or opportunity related to this perception. Sure. Th thanks, Will. Um, and maybe before I, I answer that question, just thank you for having me. I think the research that you guys have continued to do um, in this space is, is super valuable. Um, just looking at this recent report, what really struck me is a broadening uh, or expansion in health, whether it the definition of health, mental health, physical health, as well as um, just you know the broadening of where we go for information and the expectation of who's involved in health. As Christy said earlier, it's everyone is involved in health. So I think it's it's really exciting just to, to see this research and see the evolution and also challenges us to complete to, to um, really constantly involve, evolve. Um, but going back to your question, um, indeed, um, it's a surprising at first take to see that people are going to their family and friends as much as physicians. But at the same time, for me, it, it really makes sense. And, and that's for two reasons. Number one, as we can all attest to, health is personal. And so going to friends and family and those that really care about you, that are closest to you, for me, it really makes sense. I think the other um, element that comes to mind is all of the barriers that we have in terms of getting the information that we need and that we can trust and we can understand. You know, in my work with patient organizations and leaders, we know um, that gaps in health literacy and understanding in all sorts of disease areas plays a significant role in people getting the care they need. On top of that, if you think about it, when you're spending two to three, max, maybe five minutes at a doctor's visit, it doesn't really give you the opportunity to leave with the information you need, the explanation you need, getting the answers to the questions you have. So Indeed, I can understand why we're seeing this, this outcome from the research that you have done. In terms of risks, I think it's obvious that the misinformation, um, you know, and we've seen it even in the last two years with COVID. Um, as we watched COVID spread across the, um, the planet, it was, I think you could say that there was an equal spread of like misinformation across the planet that also then led to a lot of um, mistrust. Um, th so that's a, a key risk. Um, from, uh, in terms of um, having people going to different places for information. At the same time, I, I think there's a big opportunity um, from a patient engagement perspective. I think we have the opportunity to really lean in. Um, and I think we can do this, this in two ways. Number one, developing really strong partnerships with patient organizations. I mean, they play a critical role here. They help patients and their families um, get the information they need, be well better informed. They really help patients ease the burden that comes with trying to navigate a complex healthcare system. So um, yeah, patient advocacy groups, patient experts, patient influencers are growing in number and also influence. And so I think they're leaning in in terms of working with them is a real opportunity. Um, and the second one is there's an opportunity to leverage the increased activation from patients. Um, there's a clear shift in terms of their expectations Consumers want to be more informed. That's why they're looking to families and friends and elsewhere for information. They want greater ownership of their care. And what we know is that when me or you or a patient is um, much more engaged in their health care, it's going to lead to better outcomes. So um, as people are more engaged and activated and looking uh, 
um, for information. I think that, that we don't want to miss that opportunity in the industries we're in to really make sure that we're helping them get the information that they want. Ruth, I appreciate that perspective and having worked closely with your team around the patient advocacy uh, work that you're doing. Um, I can um, genuinely say that you are doing more than just talking the talk when it comes to taking that action and some of the initiatives that you are leading with the business, the team at Novartis, uh, genuinely among the best that we've seen. So it's wonderful to hear you uh, talking the talk, but also walking the walk when it comes to those pieces. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in pivoting slightly because I think data um, from a public affairs standpoint, when we think about how um, influence needs to change, right? This conversation that's taking place. One of the data points that stood out to me was that over half, so 55%, so over half of people surveyed said that healthy options actually cost too much, right? And then almost one in two said that lack, they lack the right information to help take better care of their health. So Ruth has just talked through uh, some of those components about the patient advocacy side of it. But you lead public affairs for Sanofi across Asia. So I'm guessing you have a slightly different perspective. I'd be interested in what action you feel maybe needs to be. Sorry, a build, a build perspective, not a not a reject perspective, of course. Uh, but I'd be interested in some in your perspective about what actions companies need to take, the manufacturers might need to take to help address those gaps. And if you've got any recommendations for people to think about. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Wilt. I'm I'm uh... Totally agree what Ruth mentioned earlier in terms of the patient association. How can we lie the better? We can we can share more part later. But I think you rightly point out that um, indeed cost is a hot topic for many people. But from from public affairs perspective, we we work on the topic of sustainable healthcare financing is underway there for many governments around the world, not just for Asia Pacific. Um, and driving sustainable healthcare financing is not just about price reduction. Is involve many sector policymakers, NGO, academia. Uh, we work together, we have key role to play. If I can take Singapore as a sample, um, Singapore government just recently launched Healthier SG. I think it's a perfect example to demonstrate primary care and preventive care can contribute to the sustainable healthcare financing from, from a total ecosystem perspective. Then I think industry can play a key role in that ecosystem. And I think the other part I think I want to emphasize is COVID-19 pandemic actually, it gave a, a perfect example to demonstrate the public-private partnership because no one can solve the issues alone. And we see that more policymakers, uh, at regional and global institutions, they would like to work with industry. Of course, you can see the difference. Some government or some institution, they may take a more conservative approach they don't want to just partner with industry alone. That's why from public affairs, I think it's very important how to strengthen your external stakeholder strategy, make sure that you have a multi-stakeholder partnership to make it happen, and then can help you to debunk a lot of the misinformation to help you to engage a lot of stakeholder rather than just rely on single channel to make it happen. You know, Ada, that point that you're making around collaboration is really important because we're evolving the way that we think about collaboration. If I go back, say, five, maybe 10 years, when we talked about collaboration, we might say, well, it's important for uh, leaders within the pharmaceutical space to collaborate with one another. So we took some time to think about what that might look like and how we could partner together with industry organisations or otherwise. I think the point that you're making today is actually really interesting, particularly when we look at the, that data that we showed earlier on around it is the expectation of consumers that health will be delivered by more than just the health sector. And so when it comes to public health considerations, whether it be around diet and lifestyle, medical intervention, therapeutic or technology, there's this clear space for the health industry, but then there also seems to be potential for collaboration with other, sec with other sectors like food and beverage, um, or even the, you know, we saw fashion and retail. Um, I've been really excited um, and emotionally distraught due to uh, the, the campaign that Dove uh, launched just last week or the week before, which is around body image and self-esteem. And thinking about how a brand like Dove, which clearly has for some time now taken a stand around self, self and body image and, um, and you're loving yourself, but really tackling a very difficult area 
the health sector. And for me, one of those outcomes is that we really need to start looking at partners from less usual places where the unlikely places are. And Ada, I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know whether you've seen any great examples of that, or whether you're kind of, as part of the SG, Healthy SG, have you seen types of examples of that happening as well? Um, yes, indeed. I, I think we see much more different partnership, not just traditional regional institutions. We see a uh, core sector partnership. If I use healthcare sector as an example, we see more partnership. Actually, it can be within food industry to partner with healthcare sector because you're talking to the public as well. I think you give the company different scope rather just watch a solo way, a silo way to work with a single sector. I think it's a very interesting aspect for us to see. A preventive care is a great example. Preventive, you talk about food, you talk about drinks, you talk about vaccination, you talk about self-care lifestyle. So many scope can contribute to the preventive care. That's the answer to your question from a healthy SG perspective. It does give industry, not just healthcare sector. Of course, many sectors a great opportunity to contribute to this important moment. Yeah, I look violent agreement with you. I think this is a really exciting moment in time for us uh, to recognize that it's everyone's responsibility to help us every component of us all. Um, I might switch a gear um, and Aliana, um, we've so we've talked about the patient and the advocacy component. We've thought about uh, what it looks like from a public affairs lens, but you're spending a lot of time in a Corporate, corporate reputation piece, you're working in cross markets. And so the data has shown us that our friends and family have surged in believability. We've just seen an 11 point increase in people's trust in their family and friends. Um, sometimes you get good advice, other times you don't. Um, in fact, I had some advice from a colleague two days ago and I went into Watson's and I bought a, my very first traditional Chinese medicine. It's, uh, so so I'm even, even people within the sector you know, taking action and thinking about that as well. So. When that comes to colleagues and peers, how should or could we help colleagues use this data to make better decisions about efforts to educate around disease awareness or even therapeutic initiatives? You're doing some work clearly in the vaccination space, public health work that you're doing in Singapore. What's the play when it comes to working with our counterparts? Yeah, no, it's really interesting when you look at the the data, right, about how trust in media kind of has gone down. But meanwhile, trust in peers and, you know, um, families and friends have gone up. There's a couple of reflections I have there. So one is it's, it's you know, it's not surprising. I think the earliest communities on earth kind of relied on each other, right? Like, where did you get your information when you were a village of 10 people? It's from one another. So I think it's going back to basics in some sense. Um, the other reflection there was, you know, despite this, you know, trusted media going down low, trusted peers going up high, where do these people get their information from? And a large part of it is still the media, right? Like, and, and, and so in some ways, media, social media, all of these like different sources of information and different platforms still pl play a very critical role because they do inform the people that we trust to get information from in some way. So, um, you know, th that's that's one area. So I think in, in terms of raising disease awareness, things like that, I think those platforms continue to be very important. But then that's also where corporate reputation and the importance of building that is also important because at the end of the day, as a healthcare care company, if you're trying to provide disease information, you need to be a trusted source of information. So, you know, it, it's, it's part of the different sources of information that your peers and your friends and family is going to get. Um, from and you're you're one of those sources of information. So I think if you build up that corporate reputation, um, people are more likely to trust information from you as well. So when you think about any kind of disease awareness activities, that's why you have the PESO model, right? Like what is your paid channel? What is your earned channel? Your socials? Your own channel? Because all of these channels are very important in terms of getting that information out there. And obviously, there's varying levels of trust from people across all those different channels, but that's why it's really important that you continue to build your own corporate, you know, reputational channel, because that is going to be an important source of information um, for people as well moving forward. 
Mm. And that challenge around um, ensuring buy-in from the top of our organisation seems to be something that um, is gathering um, gathering speed, right? The interest and the openness to, to thinking about that from an internal perspective. Um, I wonder um, where we find, I'll, I'll come back to you as well to talk a little bit more about the employer, but I wonder around that, and if, if I can come back to you on this one as well, um, starting to think about the APIS initiative that you've recently run. Um, and uh, for those of you um, who are unaware, um, APIS is an initiative which was essentially designed to accelerate access for patients by aligning on healthcare challenges. Um, so, so um, Ruth, our data suggests that many people believe that the average person can do enough research, that extraordinary note that Kirsty pointed out there, saying, I can do enough research that makes me about as intelligent or as ready as my own physician. Um, so in light of that, you know, what's the action to take? And, is, and, and is, is there some concern there for you as well? But from a patient standpoint, how do we manage that balance? Yeah, it is an interesting finding, um, especially, you know, around the younger generations, like you said, are educating themselves, not only just for their own health, but also for the health of their parents and uh, their, you know, and other people in their family. Um, for me, it also brings to mind the reality of healthcare influencers, maybe somebody who, uh, you know, a community that we haven't worked with closely in, in the past, but um, if they're there as a kind of information, if they're providers of information, how can we partner with them? But yeah, you know, the, the APIS platform, APIS stands for, for those who don't know, stands for the Alliance and, and Partnerships for Patient Innovation and Solutions. Um, it's a platform that we started three years ago, um, and it's really us working together with patient leaders, advocates, healthcare experts, anyone in this space who has a common goal, that's hence the Alliance, and wants to work with us long-term, hence the partnership to really address many of the barriers that or hurdles that stand in, in the way of people getting the care they want. Um, but the innovation and solution piece for me is, is what really ties into the, the question that you had just asked. You know, we talk about innovation because we recognize that we can't do the same thing that we've been doing before to get to different outcomes. So how are we going to innovate in our thinking and, and sort of the solutions that we're proposing? And then the solution part recognizes that, you know, we're going beyond medicine from a pharmaceutical perspective and really looking at getting people solutions that they want. I mean, in the, the data talked about speak to me as a whole person. So it's not just about my disease, but about the life I'm trying to, to lead. Um, you know, the patient advocacy groups and experts that we work with for many programs, including APIS, have, have, have advised that there's two areas that we should focus on. Um, and we've been looking at this for the last two years. Number one is health literacy. You know, um, and health literacy is not just about people having access to the information that's correct, but it's also about ensuring that the information has stopping power. Like, you know, is it going to be in a way that people are going to be interest to inter interested to read it? Um, and then also that's engaging and, and understandable and actionable. You know, we all get lots of information, but how do we make sure that it really is going to hit home? Um, the other element that we've been working on with um, the patient experts is on digital is a digital and digital channels. So how do we make sure that we go and provide information where people are going in a way that in a way that um, they can actually absorb and in a way that's also credible. But going back to a little bit of what Aliana said, I, I think anyone communic communicating about health, whether it's physician, pharma, employers, patient groups, all really have to work closely to understand the audience. And, and ensure that we're providing information that is credible, um, science-based, but also accessible. And accessible, I mean, not just channels, but from a cultural standpoint, from a health literacy standpoint, um, you know, they say knowledge is power. And so any of us who are trying to provide that knowledge need to ensure that the knowledge people have is actually empowering. Um, so that, I'll stop there. That's what I would say. Oh, I totally appreciate that. I mean, that, that's, you know, one of the toughest pieces around the language that we use, um, which often can be uh, in a challenging piece from even from a regular, in an internal regulatory system. You know, you want to challenge for the communications team to think about, well, how do we speak in language that is plain and that will be usable? And in our very unique market, we then need to apply multiple languages, cultural considerations, all of these additional pieces. And that's before we start creating content and start distributing it as well. Um, as you know, I think we've had um, 
uh, a few um, instances where we've had multiple translations taking place at the same time. And, you know, that's one step to move us forward. Um, but that localised piece just continues to be the last. Kirsty, I'm going to um, maybe ask you to weigh in here. So, so you've now, you launched the uh, data for us about two weeks ago globally. Um, you've sat in front of a couple of clients, you did the breakfast session this morning, you're now doing this one too. Um, what's standing out to you? And from maybe based on the conversation that's happening, what are some of those things that are, you know, spot lit for you? Yeah. So, you know, I'm really enjoying listening to the session, really terrific specificity on, on some of the implications of the data. I think a few things jumped out at me. First of all, you know, we all knew the impact of COVID in terms of income uh, inequalities. I think that's now super stark. You know, when you look at the gap in trust between high income, low income, you look at the global economy, I think everybody has to find ways to lean in to close those gaps. So that's number one. Number two, I'm still stunned by that figure, you know, 18 to 34 year olds, 44% of them believing they can be as informed as a doctor. Um, that, that really jumped out and that has jumped out in every presentation I think we've given on the data. Um, the confidence in the employer and the role, that, that it's sort of a responsibility and obligation that I think is now there from the employer. When there's so much going on in the world, people are really leaning in and they trust what's coming from their from their companies. So that, that's fascinating and that's a, a, a mantle that I think employers have deserved, but you need to work hard to hang on to it. I think um, two last points, the, the stark, messaging or reminder about how we communicate. If you think of those two different worlds, if you trust the healthcare system and if you don't, you really operate differently. And I think it doesn't mean our message changes, but I think who then becomes the messenger? Uh, are they local community leaders? Are they religious leaders? Are they, you know, trust has gone local. So leaning into that um, and thinking about how we communicate. Um, in these, in these two different universes, I think is really important. And lastly, mental health. I mean, we probably all knew this, but just yesterday you saw Ted Dross making comments about the concern he has around loneliness um, and what it's doing to people's health. So I think big call out for everybody here on probably what was happening in the pandemic, but I think we're gonna see it for a long time to come, the impact of the last three years on, on global mental health. Thanks, Kirsty. I don't know that there's anybody that could have given us that same kind of uh, perspective given the roundtable conversations we've been having. So I really appreciate you providing that perspective. I just, in the in the interest of time, I want to uh, ask one question that has come from the Q and A. Um, this is an open question for the panel. Um, so uh, any, any any feel free to jump in if you wish. Um, the question here um, is with regards to middle income and emerging economies, which seem to enjoy a higher trust than high income or developed economies. So, and it's not just in obvious areas like the impact of inequality, but also across institutions and healthcare systems. So the question from the floor is whether um, folk have any uh, ideas about what might be driving that trend. What is it that's happening in these either um, these middle, um, these middle or in, in income or emerging economies so, so that we see higher trust coming through. So I'm happy to, have a, to offer some thoughts on this, um, having had longer than everybody else to look at this data. It, it, it is a really, I think it's a really astute question and it's one that I think we looked at as well. I, I think a couple of things. Um, I think it speaks to how some countries navigated COVID. I think that, you know, some, higher income countries probably didn't navigate this as well as people expected. I think it also partially relates to some data we saw in our annual trust barometer in January, when we looked at trust in the four institutions that we always track, business, government, NGOs, and media. The, the two that scored, that were not trusted, but were in a woeful state and, and decline in the last few years were government and media. And the thinking behind that seemed to be that people had gone to the extremes. So that, you know, to get more votes or to get more clicks or to get more viewers, that the conversation had moved from the centres to the extremes. So I have a theory that 
there is an element of polarization. And I think all of you referred to um, the pandemic and the infodemic that we've been through, that I think that plays hugely, the polarization and the, the misinformation and the channels, I think is partly an explanation for that. Anyone care to build? I think, I mean, I agree, agree with what Kirsty said. I think um, having spent a lot of time early in my career in the US and now coming here, I think also it relates to where we are in healthcare in terms of its availability and accessibility in this part of the world. Um, and I, I think in terms of health and its provision where we're early in the access story, I think we have a long way to go to, to build, but also break that trust when it comes to healthcare. Um, as they say, you know, trust and, and reputation take you know years to build but just a minute to to fall apart and and just like that so I think we are we're still in a place in healthcare where we are dealing with access issues and 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 people getting the care they need and that's where the focus has been and 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 once we can maybe get to where we want to be then maybe trust will become an issue here more than it is probably in in the western world yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, Maybe, well, if I can just add, um, you know, it's really interesting because I think in one of the data points, it was in, I think, in the US or France where the distrust was quite high. Um, and, you know, in, in places like China, the, the trust was quite good. Um, and then, you know, you can try to maybe have some theories around you know, the, the state of democracies and, and those two types of, uh, you know, those types of countries. And it's interesting because in one of the data points as well, lack of information was, was a really important barrier to like how people, you know, get healthy. Um, and it's really more about lack of credible information. I think in, in maybe more democratic societies where you have freedom of the press and lots of different types of press, right? Like there's, millions of different media outlets in a, in a country like the US versus maybe in a country like China where it's quite centralized. And so, you know, the information that you get might be more streamlined. And so therefore, maybe that level of trust in that information is higher because they're not getting too much conflicting information versus in a more democratic society where you have too much information and too much kind of freedom of press, there's no such thing, but, you know, where there's too much information and too much conflicting information, that's where maybe um, that's driving that, that gap as well. So it, it's really just like a, a very interesting um, data point to see for sure. Thank you, Eliana. And look, um, we're right up on time. So it's a really strong note to leave us on for this discussion. That hour has gone by rapidly. I can't believe how quickly that's gone. Um, I do want to say uh, thank you, Ada, Aliana, and Ruth for taking the time to talk through the data with us. Um, we had about 75 people who joined the call with us today from across the region. So to those of you who have dialed in, I want to say thank you as well. Um, hopefully it's been a worthwhile investment of your time. Um, anyone that has joined today uh, will also get um, an email sent through to them with all of the data different resources, opportunities for you to use this in your own uh, workplace and with your, um, with your colleagues. Um, as always, if uh, folk are interested, the Edelman team is more than happy to connect with you individually and think about how we can help you build this into your, your business strategy. But overall, I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, we are living and working in incredible times. Um, clearly, there are some headwinds ahead of us regards to economic pressures and some of the sensitivities that we've talked about today. Um, but based on this conversation, I feel optimistic about what we have in front of us. And so thank you again for joining us. Thank you for those of you who dialed in. And Kirsty, um, while you're here in Singapore, thank you for joining us and uh, helping us have such a great discussion today.